Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Greg Cushing. I'm the vicar of Allfold and Loxford Parish in the Church of England, right at the bottom of Guildford Diocese. This service, online service, is filmed for the 3rd of July, 2022. And as ever, it's a privilege to host you, um, to lead you in an online uh, act of worship. And I pray whoever you are, whether you're a wholehearted Christian longing to, uh, to praise God this morning, or somebody simply looking in, window shopping as it were, I pray that this service blesses you, helps you, and all those things. And I want to say, if you're ever in our locality, um, in bottom of Surrey, top of West Sussex, please do drop in. We'd love to meet you. Anyway, with all that said, I want to start with a few notices. Um, congratulations, first off, to our curate, James. He was priested yesterday. Um, congratulations to all the cohort um, of uh, your, your curates as well, who are being priested likewise in Guildford Cathedral. Um, it's a special day, therefore, in our parish today and all of our physical services because James is going to be presiding at Holy Communion for the first time. It's apt, therefore, that we start a new sermon series today. Uh, we're starting a sermon series titled Christian Jargon Busting. And the word that we're thinking about today, I thought, was quite timely. The Eucharist, as James leads his first Eucharist. Well, not many notices today. Before I open in prayer, I thought I'd just share a few photos of what an amazing church weekend we had uh, last week. See those photos? Um, it was in Otford Manor, um, where Oak Hall Holidays is based. They were brilliant, very helpful, cooking us up some scrumptious food, um, helping us find our way around um, the beautiful house, which at times felt like a, a rabbit warren. I think we all got lost at one point. But just stunning scenery, great teaching from uh, Paul Perkin. And um, we just had a really, really nice time. So if you're looking at those photos thinking, oh, I missed out, well, we're going to be going again, maybe next year or the year after, but whenever we do, make sure you get the dates in your diary. Well, now we come to our formal service today. I'm going to begin with a prayer. It's for the third Sunday after Trinity, and it is an amazing prayer. So please do listen as I pray these words, and after that, we'll sing together. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin. You have sent the spirit of your son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation might be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
us pray. Lord God, thank you for loving us even when we turn away from you. We are grateful for your constant care and concern. Though we feel unworthy of your great love, we thank you that through our weaknesses you give us strength and in our wanderings you show us the way. Father, help us to be more loving in our homes. Make us thoughtful for others and help us to think of kind things to do. Keep us from grumbling and ill temper and help us to be cheerful when things go wrong and our plans are upset. May we learn to love and understand each other and think of others before ourselves. We trust to your loving care the members of our families, both near and far. Supply their needs, guide their footsteps, keep them safe of body and soul, and may your peace rest upon our homes and upon our dear ones everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are sick in body, mind and spirit. Thinking of anyone we know that needs you to bring them your peace in their pain, your strength in their weakness and your comfort in their sadness. We pray for the world and all the countries that are suffering unrest, especially remembering the people of Ukraine in their current crisis. Give them courage and much needed help in these times. Lord, we pray for our community and our church family, for Greg and Ellie and everyone else involved in the running and upkeep of the churches. We give thanks for James and congratulate him on his ordination and pray that you will continue to guide and lead him along the way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through him who loved us. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks and broke it, he said, This is my body, for which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for that reading, Trevor. Shall we begin with a prayer? Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for those verses in 1 Corinthians. And we ask now, as we gather online, wherever we are, that um, you would speak to us. Uh, speak through the busyness, all those whirring thoughts that are going around in our mind about last week, perhaps the week coming up. Would we hear your voice, your voice that lasts for all eternity? And would we be changed for your glory? Amen. Amen. Well, friends, today we are beginning a new thematic sermon series titled Christian Jargon Busting. And uh, we're going to be thinking about words like propitiation and the covenant and sanctification. I'm really looking forward to it. Anyway, today, with James, our curate's priesting uh, happening yesterday, and with him in our physical services today, presiding at communion for the first time, our Christian jargon word is Eucharist. You might know that it comes from the Greek word to give thanks, Eucharitso, 
And for any who I've already lost with these Christian jargon words, what we're referring to is the part of the service where we share the bread and the wine. That's what we're thinking about today. Many of you will have noticed that different churches and different denominations refer, refer to this part of the service in different ways, with different words. The Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, Mass, Holy Communion. Today we're going to explore a little bit about that background. At times, and I'll be honest here, the sermon might feel more like a lecture, but that's not a bad thing. I'm hoping that with the added history lesson and the background, that this precious part of the service, the bread and the wine, might become even more nourishing to you than it presently is, and that you'll have an even deeper sense of Jesus' love for you. There are five themes I uh, want to explore. Personal remembrance, powerful proclamation, unity, not uniformity, searching self-examination, and then reverential thanksgiving. Firstly then, personal remembrance. And uh, once again, Trevor, thank you for that reading. 1 Corinthians 11, it picks up on the Last Supper where Jesus, he broke the bread and he shared the wine and he said those words, do this in remembrance of me. Can you picture yourself there? You're at the table as a disciple, watching Jesus with your very own eyes. He's breaking the bread and then he hands it to you and he says, this is my body. What would that mean for you? What would it mean for you? I think for, for many of us, uh, we'd be so moved that we'd cherish that little piece of bread. We'd want to lock it up in our safest, most secret place. Never want to lose it. Yes, it would probably go mouldy there, and we'd be missing the point, wouldn't we? You see, when Jesus says, this is my body, he can't literally be meaning that the bread is his actual body, because that would bring into question how much he truly identifies with us and is able to represent us. If he had a body that is able to kind of compartmentalise and form extra bits of body and broken pieces of bread, then actually he's not fully human in the way that we are all human. And at that point, can he really act as a substitution for other human beings with his death on the cross? Similarly, when Jesus said to his disciples, I am the gate, they didn't all of a sudden see him transform into you know, a white picker swinging gate in front of them. No. When Jesus says these things, he's using metaphor is deeply symbolic and the disciples would go on to understand all of these things much more deeply after his crucifixion. You see, at his crucifixion, as they saw his body broken, his arms pulled wide, stretched right out of socket, broken, pierced to the wooden crossbeam, his flesh torn so much that the blood flowed, then they realised, they remembered what the supper meant, what he was referring to, his death. Don't forget this. We're so forgetful. I know I am. I'm sure you are as well. Human beings, we are so forgetful. Even as Christians, we can sometimes kind of walk around through life and we feel unloved. We feel unappreciated. While all the while, Jesus is with a megaphone from heaven shouting, don't forget how much I love you. Have you forgotten the extent of my love on the cross? That was for you. Someone once said that we're like one of those old food dispenser machines. You remember those ones where you kind of type in the number of what you want, the Twix or the Mars bar, whatever it was, and then you put your money in. Unfortunately, sometimes the money gets stuck at the top, doesn't it? And you have to kind of bang the machine until, as the saying goes, the penny drops. Well, we're a bit like that. Sometimes for, for us, the, the theological points get stuck. and We just need to bang ourselves on the head with remembrance. It's why the Church of England has Canon B14 in Canon Law, which states that a parish should be celebrating communion every Sunday. Don't forget what Jesus did for you. And you see it with the visual picture, the bread and the wine. Here's what an ex-bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, uh, wrote. He said this, God took care 
that his death for sinners should not merely be written in the Bible, for then it might have been locked up in libraries, or left to the ministry to proclaim from the pulpit, for then it might soon have been kept back by false teachers, but that it should be exhibited in visible signs and emblems, even in bread and wine at a special ordinance. The Lord's Supper was a standing provision against man's forgetfulness. The Lord Jesus knew full well when the unspeakable speakable importance of his death for sin. And so, Ryle says, he took care that his death at any rate should never be forgotten. And he instituted the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, Holy Communion. So, next time you personally in a physical service receive the bread and the wine, by faith will you see Jesus on the cross once again and know that he was hanging there with you in mind to take away your sin, to deal with your guilt and shame. Why? Because he loves you oh so very much. Now, before we move on, this obviously has some quite important implications for the way we approach this Eucharist. And I remind you that I personally speak as an Anglican, but more importantly, I'm one who's just simply trying to make sense of what the Bible teaches here. Firstly then, our church buildings don't contain altars. You think of what we refer to up there in the chancel. An altar in the Bible is where a sacrifice happens. And what we do on a Sunday, in the words of Jesus, is remember his once and for all sacrifice. We could call, therefore, the place where he was sacrificed, Golgotha, remember the mound, the skull? That is the altar of all altars. But we certainly don't sacrifice Jesus over and over again, Sunday by Sunday, in all fold and locks with Paris. No. We call that up there a table, not an altar. And a table is something that we can all gather around and have fellowship around. An altar in the Old Testament, is where a priest, with his back to the congregation, performs something for God. Again, at Holy Communion, we're remembering what God has done for us. We're not doing anything for God. Now, please, 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 don't think that I'm nitpicking on semantics here. I know we don't always mean exactly what we say theologically. Sometimes we refer to the altar just because, you know, that makes sense to people when they come in the building. But I'm just giving you the background and, and seeing where that goes if you, if you see the theological meaning in it. Uh, this then also has implications for James's priesting yesterday. He's not, as of today, able to preside at the Eucharist because he's any more special than, than you or any other lay member. No. The Church of England has this delayed deaconing and priesting period simply to act as a safeguard against being too casual with this precious, precious sacrament. Remember, we have one high priest, Jesus, who funnily enough also happens to be the sacrificial victim, the Lamb of the world. Priests down here, like myself, we simply act as, as, as conduits, channels, to help you focus on him better. In fact, I believe one of the greatest skills a minister can have down here is to almost be forgotten about when, when leading communion, uh, to lead, guide, pray in such a way that your hearts and minds are focused on him up there, on the Lord Jesus. So firstly then, that was personal remembrance. Moving on to our second theme, and the first one was the longest, by the way, powerful proclamation powerful proclamation. It has been said that a church should have two things, a pulpit to remind us of what God has said and a table to remind us of what God has done. Can you imagine how powerful that meal of bread and wine could have been in years gone by when congregations didn't have the Bible in their own language, couldn't understand what was said from the pulpit in Latin? The table speaks to all because it's visual. And for that reason, I might add, it must be treated, therefore, very carefully so it doesn't mislead people. Did you clock verse uh, 26 in 1 Corinthians 11? Paul says, 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is no surprise that for a very long time, Jewish people have used matzo, uh, that kind of bread, that unleavened bread, as the Passover bread. And it's not simply because it's unleavened. It's also striped and pierced, reminding them of that great verse in Isaiah 53, verse 5. We know it's about Jesus. Um, as Christians, that's what we believe. But it was spoken of 700 years or so before Jesus' birth. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, the matzo bread, we are healed. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, later the place Holy Communion holds within each of our hearts. Because it, it can be everything to us in a very unhealthy way. But similarly, many churches today can see Holy Communion is, is a bit of an inconvenience. So many large churches now that hardly ever have Holy Communion in their main morning service because it's cumbersome, they think. It takes time. It feels Catholic and people don't understand what is happening. And therefore, they, they rattle off an 845 BCP Holy Communion which hardly anybody comes to, just as a box-ticking exercise, so they can free up their main service for all the good stuff. Friends, that is a shame. It's a great shame. The Eucharist is a powerful proclamation of the Gospel. With just a few words of explanation, even the most unaware non-Christian visitor can see something of the depth and the richness of Christianity through its lens. Uh, Similarly, for us Christians, I should say, it's also a reminder of the future. We got that at the end of verse 26, that Jesus is coming back. Personal remembrance, powerful proclamation. Thirdly, unity, not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity. You might remember that part during Holy Communion, where the minister breaks the bread, and he says, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Remember that? There's something there isn't there about the breadth of the church. We are many, and yet there is unity. We are one body. And I believe that the church of Corinth, remember this is 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 we're reading. The church in Corinth, needed correcting in this area there was there was some who treated church sort of like a country club and at that country club there were loads of other people just like themselves they were wealthy they were well dressed they were well educated and that group of people they looked down on everyone who didn't quite make their levels of eliteness and that was wrong writes Paul they mistook unity for uniformity. They all look the same. And in their arrogance, 1 Corinthians tells us that they would actually try and celebrate communion together without including the rest of the church. Deeply divisive. Friends, Holy Communion is much more special than that because our God is much more generous and colourful than we could ever possibly hope for. The picture of heaven, where history is heading, God's original intention, is one of all peoples and tribes and languages and nations worshipping Jesus. And when we approach Holy Communion, it reminds us that, yes, although we are many, we come in different shapes and sizes and colours and personalities with different cultures and languages, and all that diversity is precious to God. It flows out from him. It's important, friends, that we get this. Because, sadly, throughout church history, stances on Holy Communion have caused so many horrible divisions. I remember writing an essay at Theological College titled, What is at stake in debates about real presence within the Eucharist? 
And I began the essay, essay by saying that the word steak in the title was very ironic, considering Thomas Cranmer, author of the Book of Common Prayer, was burned at the stake in 1556 for his views on the Eucharist. Now, hopefully such torture wouldn't happen any longer today, but it is worth pausing just a moment here to ask that question, where do we locate the spiritual benefit in administering a sacrament that has literally led people to be burned alive? Uh, firstly, just then, in that essay title, I mentioned the term real presence. And some of you will be familiar with the, the Catholic belief of transubstantiation, which holds that something's actual nature can change whilst its outward appearance remains unaltered. So, although it looks like bread and wine, transubstantiation, transubstantiation holds that it's actually, behind that disguise, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the literal body and blood of Christ. And for that reason, priests will be very careful not to drop any crumbs on the floor because that's the body of Christ. And for that reason, in some churches, you'll see how the reserved sacrament, bread and wine that isn't used on that particular Sunday in that service, is treated as holy, kept in a safe with the light left on above, reminding all of how special the wine and bread is that's kept there. Now, I recognize that I've oversimplified some of that, and I really don't mean to sound hurtful in any way, but as I've expressed, I think that we're to understand Jesus' words, this is my body, as metaphorical and symbolic. The nourishment, therefore, isn't simply in the actual bread. You only get a little bit anyway. Uh, secondly, another view is that this is merely remembrance. But again, we conclude that there must be something different to actually taking part in this meal. Otherwise, we could simply sit down on our own and remember the Last Supper and receive the same spiritual nourishment as we do from physically taking part in it. Uh, thirdly, and uh, finally, think of that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. I haven't read it yet today, but it says this. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? The spiritual nourishment comes somehow through participation with Jesus as we partake in this meal with other believers. There's a mystery there, but it's in the, the physically taking part as a united body of believers, that somehow Christ ministers to us spiritually. Here's what the great reformer John Calvin said. He said this, We must establish such a presence of Christ in the supper as may neither fasten him to the element of bread nor enclose him in the bread. For these things are plainly in conflict with a nature truly human. Instead, he writes that Christ is present with us, quote, dwelling in us by his spirit, he raises us to heaven himself, transfusing into us the vivifying vigor of his flesh. I like that. Suffice to say, the nourishment, the, the, the benefit we receive of taking part in this institution, this sacrament, is more than just eating the bread. It's spiritual, as the community of faith shares this meal together. Unity, not uniformity. Fourthly, searching self-examination. Searching self-examination. I wonder what you made of verses 28 to 29 of uh, chapter 11. It says this, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Do you take this warning seriously? Holy Communion is a holy sacrament. We might not see it in the physical present, but Christianity is distinctly spiritual. And we could be heaping judgment on ourselves if we simply waltz into this meal without reverence. Jesus, although not referring specifically to the Eucharist, said, Similarly, at the Sermon on the Mount, you know, if you go to the altar, 
And there, remember that you're at odds with your brother. First get reconciled. Well, so much more with communion, because it's all about communion and fellowship. Is there someone you need to apologize to before you next receive the bread and the wine? Take Jesus' words seriously, friends. The Church of England takes this seriously. In the BCP, we have the words of the prayer of humble access, a last chance of, of self-reflection uh, self reflection just before the receiving, a last chance to remember that we haven't done anything to earn this fellowship. It's all grace. Is it similarly, I know that James, as I said, who's leading communion for the first time today in our physical services, I know that he likes hearing and will like saying the words of common worship. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, dot, dot, dot. Uh, sometimes I say those words. At other times, I simply say, look, if you love Jesus, then this meal is for you. But if you're not too sure yet, then there's no compulsion to come up. Take your time. Feel comfortable in the pews as you think about what the church is doing now. Basically, by saying those kinds of words, we're bringing you into that depth of self-examination and those verses in 1 Corinthians 11. James and I and other ministers, we don't have x-ray vision. We can't see into your lives and all the things that you're doing, all the, the sinful uh, little secrets that you're keeping behind closed doors. Neither can you into our lives. It's unlikely, not impossible, <laughs> but it's very unlikely that on a Sunday we're going to ban you from coming to Holy Communion. And so when we say those words, the onus is on you. Are you right with God? Are you living by faith? Are you right with your neighbour? Self-examination. Be careful how you approach Holy Communion. And then fifthly and finally, reverential thanksgiving. Reverential thanksgiving. It is interesting that the Reformers who were very conscious of distancing themselves from anything that spoke of sacrifice, they also questioned, believe it or not, the use of the word Eucharist. Eucharist basically means thank you, and in that sense is Godward. It's us doing something for God. We're thanking you, God. This is what we're doing. And they wanted to make the service of communion more manward, i.e. God doing something for us, namely reminding us of Christ's death. Now, make of that what you will. But that is why I have referred to reverential thanksgiving. I could have said humble or respectful. Lord, we recognise that this is all because of you. And, you know, we're not patting ourselves on the back down here in any way by doing this. This, this, is, this is all you. That's our attitude. And so, once again, our five themes. Personal remembrance, powerful proclamation, unity, not uniformity, searching self-examination, and reverential thanksgiving. And I hope you've seen through these lenses that in one sense, all the changes to practice COVID has brought hasn't mattered all that much. What matters more than the practice is our attitude, our heart. As I close, one question. How should we treat Holy Communion? Where should we place it in our lives of spiritual worship? Like with the Ark in the Old Testament, we can easily get the position wrong, can't we? When we treat it like an idol, it is no good. When we're careless with it, like Uzzah was trying when he tried to steady the Ark and he was zapped immediately, brought down judgment on himself. Likewise, when we defile it, as the Philistines did, it, it brought down a whole nation. But when we treat it with respect, holding it in its rightful place, like with the ark in Obed-Edom, you might remember, it brought profound blessing. That, friends, is the Eucharist, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. What a blessing. Amen. Living bread and mercy broken, Jesus. Broken.
body for need. We give thanks as we receive it for this bread, this life indeed. Your presence and the power.